Okay, my name is Mr. Singleton, and today we're going to be going over a lesson on what it means to analyze something. So on a lot of tests and a lot of questions and just in a lot of what you do in school, you're asked to analyze things, and sometimes it's a little difficult for us to know what does it actually mean to analyze something. So when we analyze something, um, we're talking about breaking down and explaining something complicated into smaller parts to gain a better understanding of it. And actually, we analyze things all the time. You should be used to analyzing things. Maybe you don't realize you're analyzing things, but we analyze all sorts of stuff. Um, of course, we analyze sports plays. We have people whose job it is to be sports analysts, right? Um, we analyze relationships all the time, right? Well, uh, she said this, and so I think it means that, or, or he looked at me this way, so I think it means that. We analyze relationships in that way. Um, we analyze stats and data. Anytime we put something into a chart and we kind of break it up and organize it um, and try to explain numbers, that's analysis. Um, we analyze things people say. We analyze body language. We analyze song lyrics even. Um, today, we're going to talk about what it means to analyze and then look at how that applies specifically to analyzing writing because that's what you're going to be asked to do most often. Okay, to start out our practice on analysis, we're going to look at an analysis of uh, a football play, and we're going to look at what it means to analyze a sports play, so that way we can apply it to analyzing writing. So take a second and watch this clip of Marshawn Lynch from the Seattle Seahawks. This is a couple years ago um, in a playoff game against the New Orleans Saints. He broke off an amazing touchdown run, and actually it was... Uh, a touchdown run that would help them win the game. Um, one of the things that made this run famous is that the crowd at their stadium cheered so loud and so hard it actually shook the stadium and it registered on the Richter scale which uh, tells about earthquakes and those kinds of things. Take a second to watch this clip. So that's a pretty amazing play. Um, we can actually go now and look at an analysis that a writer did of this play. They, they actually watched this play over and over again and they broke it down into smaller parts. What was going on? And you're going to notice in this, in this analysis that they include different things and there's different features that make up an analysis. And the first feature is there's going to be facts. Okay. When we look at this uh, analysis, you're going to see some of what is put in there is just very detailed facts. They get down to specifically what this person is doing, what that person is doing, and they give us some facts. The next thing you'll see is the writer's opinions. They also, in an analysis, you need to give your opinion of how those things are working or what's going on in that situation. And then finally, detailed descriptions, which kind of fits in with facts, but I put that in there as something different because I think you'll see that sometimes facts are different than a little bit of a longer description. By the way, the same thing is true when we talk about analyzing writing. You're still dealing with facts about the writing, your opinions about the writing, and of course descriptions of what the writer is doing. All those things will apply to that as well. Okay, let's take a look at this. Either in print or an electronic copy, you should have a copy of this article, Breaking Down Marshawn Lynch's Big Run from January 9th, 2011 by Mike Sando. Um, go ahead and pause this video for a minute and read this analysis of the run that we just watched and I want you to specifically look for and you might even underline and highlight uh, where you see facts where you see opinions and where you see descriptions once you've done that you can go ahead and press play again and we'll continue on okay I'm glad you're back so hopefully you took a look at this and you saw all of those features in the analysis hopefully you saw stuff like in this first point there is nothing fancy about the personnel or formation that's clearly an opinion right? Um, Seattle lined up in its base offense with two backs and one tight end. That's a fact, right? And then we get other descriptions in here. 
notice that this, for instance, this point makes a little more detailed description. So hopefully you're starting to see how you analyze something and, and maybe what it sounds like to analyze something. Um, if you're wondering how analysis is important, well, or how it helps us, if you go back now and watch the same video that, that we just watched of that run, and you might even rewind and do that, if you go back and do that, you'll notice that you understand what's going on a lot more now that you've read this analysis. It helps you understand whatever the thing is you're looking at originally. Let's move on. So the reason why we're looking at this lesson is to see how we can apply analysis to writing. How are we going to analyze a piece of writing? A great way to think about writing, especially when you want to analyze something, is using this visual in your head. This is called the rhetorical triangle. And the only reason this exists is to help you remember the kinds of things you should be thinking about when you're analyzing a piece of writing. Most of us, when we approach a story or a piece of writing, we're thinking only about what it says and, and trying to understand the meaning of what it says. When you analyze something, you have to, to think a little bit different, differently. You have to think about all three of these things to really be able to analyze it. You have to start by thinking of the speaker or writer who, who wrote the piece that you're looking at. Um, what choices did they make? What uh, decisions did they make in their writing? Why did they use this word instead of another word? Why did they tell that story instead of a different story? Why did they give this example instead of another example they could have given? What choices are the writer or speaker making? But again, that's not enough by itself. It's always connected to things like the audience and the reader. When we analyze a piece of writing, we also have to think about who was the intended audience. When this writer wrote this, who did they picture reading it? Did they picture us? Most pieces of writing, probably not. Most pieces of writing are written to a specific audience that's not us. And we have to think about that audience. We have to think about how they're interpreting the things the author says. Are they going to be more comfortable with certain words instead of other words? Are they going to be more comfortable with certain examples instead of other examples? When we analyze something, along with the ideas, along with what the writer did, we also have to analyze how the audience might have received it or how they might have taken it. That's a part of analyzing writing. And then finally, that's connected to the subject or topic of the writing, actually what the writing is about. But we can't talk about any one of those things in isolation. We have to talk about all three of them together. When you analyze, you need to talk about what is being said, how it's being said, and how it's being heard. And if you can think of that when you're trying to analyze a piece of writing, it will help you understand um, how to write a better analysis. So let's practice analyzing a piece of writing. We're going to look at a famous speech given by one of the most famous baseball players of all time. It's a man named Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig played for the New York Yankees and at one time had one of the highest batting averages you could have in baseball. He was a great athlete. Everybody in the country back in, in the time that he was playing, baseball was the main sport people followed. Um, people knew who Lou Gehrig was. They knew all about him. He was an important person in culture and he gave an important speech. This is actually a picture of him giving this speech. You can see the stadium was packed. There were other people there. Um, and he's giving a speech um, that makes for a really good text for us to analyze. So if I asked you to analyze this speech, there's some things that you would need to know about the speech. If we're applying the idea of that rhetorical triangle we just looked at, if we apply that to analyzing this speech, there's some important things we need to know about the speaker, the audience, and the topic. Let's look at those things. Before we read this, we need to understand that Lou Gehrig gave this speech in 1939. And he gave this speech right after he found out that he had a rare disease that would later be actually named after him. It was called Lou Gehrig's disease um, that would gradually take away his ability to walk or even speak. And ultimately, it would cause his death. That's the information that Lou Gehrig is sharing with all his fans who adore him and praise him because of his athletic ability. And he's having to explain to these fans 
that he will no longer be able to do those things and that he'll even be facing his own death soon. So sticking with that rhetorical triangle, we also have to think about how is the audience receiving this speech? The audience who first heard this speech were mostly baseball fans. They all knew Gehrig as one of the best athletes alive. He was a hero to many. Before the speech, most of the fans were feeling sorry for Gehrig. Right? They heard about this disease, they knew he was going to give a farewell speech, and they were just feeling really sorry for him. They were pitying him. And that makes what he chooses to say all the more powerful and, and makes our analysis able to have a little more insight. Finally, we have to think about the subject of the speech. All right, This is the topic part. You'll notice in the speech, Garrick talks about being lucky and thankful. He also chooses to downplay the seriousness of the fatal disease, calling it a bad break. And we're going to think about how do those terms, if we think about the way the audience was feeling, and we think about the facts that our speaker was dealing with, when we look at all three of those things in combination, we're able to talk very intelligently and analyze very intelligently uh, why Lou Gehrig chose the words and the phrases he did. Why did he choose to say lucky? What effect did that have on his audience? If we can write about that, we're analyzing this uh, this piece of writing. Why did he say a bad break instead of a fatal illness? Why did he choose to say that? Well, if we're writing a good analysis, we could explain that and explain what effect that had on the audience. So let's look at this speech together. Either electronically or in paper, you should have a copy of this speech um, in the hand handout accompanying this lesson. So take a minute pause the video and read through that speech considering all of those factors we just talked about and then complete the assignment that goes along with it. Go ahead and do that right now. Okay. When you analyze a piece of writing or a speech, here are the questions that you should try to answer in your analysis. So these are the things you should be thinking about while you're reading and while you're analyzing that thing. You should ask things like this. Why did the author or speaker choose to write it this way? What effect did the author or speaker want to have on his or her audience? Why did the author or speaker choose these words instead of other words? What effect did the author or speaker's writing choices have on the audience? How and why did the author or speaker's words and strategies work on the audience? And what different choices could the author or speaker have made in their writing to affect their audience? If you can think about the pieces of writing you're analyzing in these ways and be looking to answer those questions, you'll see that you'll be able to really effectively analyze this piece of writing. So when will you find yourself analyzing like this? Well, there are several, there are several opportunities when you will analyze like this. Um, a lot of times you'll be asked to analyze on multiple choice exam questions, right? A lot of questions will actually use the word analyze this sentence for tone or analyze this sentence for what the author is trying to do. In fact, a good number of questions you'll see on things like the star test or AP tests, or even the SAT and ACT, will ask you questions that ask you to think in this way. They ask you to think about what is the author doing and how does that affect the audience. And those are the questions that you're going to have to think in an analytical way. So you'll be asked to analyze on all of these things. Um, essays, the STAR test, AP test, SAT. Um, in college, a lot of the things that you do in college will be analysis. Even when you're a professional and you're in your career, you'll be asked to analyze different things. And absolutely, we already talked about this, but you will analyze all the time in your real life. So keep this in mind. Complete the accompanying assignment with this lesson, and you should have a better understanding of what it means to analyze something. When you're asked questions that ask you to analyze things, um, remember all of the things we just went over here. The more you practice analyzing writing and thinking about things that you read in this framework, thinking about why the writer chose to do it this way and what effect that has on the audience, the better and better you'll become at tests, 
at answering questions, and at being able to think about things and analyzing stuff in real life as well. That's it for this lesson. Good luck on the assignment.